A lot of people want to read through the Bible and they get through Genesis, which is great. They get through most of Exodus. The last part of Exodus is a little bit hard to read through, but then they get to Leviticus and they get stuck and they quit. Well, in this video, you're going to see how you could find Jesus, the Messiah, in the book of Leviticus, and it makes it exciting. Yes, I, I won't lie. There's parts that are very challenging because what it is, it's like an instructional book where God goes over and over and over in detail what the Levitical priests, the Levite priests were to do, what their jobs were. So it's like an SOP, right? I was in the army. We had a lot of those SOPs. You might be asking, what's an SOP? Well, it just means standard operating procedure. And God's giving them an SOP, an instruction book on how to do it properly, how to be a priest, which was the mediator between God and man before Jesus came. <laughs> but when Jesus came, there was no more need because he is the mediator. We go straight to him, God the Son. We go straight to God. Remember, the temple veil was ripped from top to bottom. And that was when Jesus died on the cross. He paid for all of our sins. Now, because of his blood that was shed on that cross, his atoning blood, we have free access to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, through the Holy of Holies, through that curtain, that veil that was ripped in half. We have direct access to God because of Jesus, the high priest, the ultimate high priest, the, mediate, the mediator, right? So here we are. Let's take a look at this, the book of Leviticus. Leviticus means, and he called. Here's the Hebrew. Remember, we read Hebrew from right to left, and he called. That's what it means. So Jesus is the sacrifice, because the first part of the book of Leviticus, you're going to see these sacrifices over and over and what you're going to see in that is that Jesus was represented in all of those foreshadowings, those, those sacrifices that we see in this book. So he is, remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Remember, John the Baptist said that, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? John the Baptist said that, the greatest prophet up until Moses, or I mean, after Moses and Elijah John was even greater, Jesus said. So atonement, we're going to see that. Atonement, right? Sacrifice, substitution. So Leviticus, it's, and he called. Again, that name means, and he called. So here in Genesis 22, I want to talk about this because if you look at Genesis 22, you see Abraham and Isaac going up that mountain, walking up that mountain. You see a father and a son and God even tells them, take your only son. And they're walking up the mountain and the son's carrying the wood on his back. Let's look at the scripture. Let's check it out right now. So take now your son, God says to Abraham. He says, your only son. It wasn't his only son. Remember, he had Ishmael also. Whom you love, Isaac. And because Isaac is the son of the promise. The promise was through Isaac. Whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. So you might be asking, where is the land of Moriah? It's the area of Jerusalem before there was a Jerusalem. <laughs> so Genesis 22 continues, And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Which mountain is that? The very mountain where Jesus was crucified over almost 2,000 or even actually over 2,000 years later. Isn't that amazing, you guys? You're going to see how this ties into Leviticus. But this is where Jesus was, was crucified, right over here. Um, and this is Jerusalem, right? There used to be a temple right here during Jesus' time, Herod's temple. So here we see in Leviticus, we see the burnt offering. Remember that scripture in Genesis 22 we just read? It says, take now your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice. So in these burnt offerings, we're seeing a picture of Jesus, just like we saw a picture of Jesus in Genesis 22 with Abraham and Isaac. So in Leviticus 1, we see the burnt offering. So what it was basically, and here I'll get the big screen on this one so you can see the, um, the full presentation here. So this was the tabernacle, right? The tent, the dwelling place. And if you haven't watched my video on that, check it out because you'll get a lot of detail on that. There was these coverings over the tabernacle. This was the 
uh, before the temple was ever built. And it was a tent. It was basically a portable worship center. Inside of it was the holy place, the first chamber where the menorah was, the seven golden lampstand, the table of showbread and the incense, the altar of incense. And then over here where this light is coming up, right, this pillar of of light and smoke, this is where the, the Lord would meet. It's called the Holy of Holies, this chamber. And that's where the Lord would meet with Moses. And he would sit on the mercy seat of the ark to talk to Moses. But there was a veil right here, a thick curtain that separated these two places. And literally, the priest had to crawl underneath of it to get in there. On his hands and knees, there was no door, no opening, no hatch. uh, no The curtain didn't slide over. It was He had to get underneath of it to get in here, which is a good place to be prostrate straight before the Lord, right? You want to be uh, bowed down to him when you go into his presence. Humble yourself. So this is the outer courtyard. This is the outer fence. And these are the Levitical priests here. And these Levitical priests, the tribe of Levites, right, which was what Moses and Aaron were part of, and these guys all had a job. Their job was to take care of this portable worship center. And these are all the camps of the different tribes of Israel all around this tabernacle. So here is where they offered, they would slaughter, and they were like butchers, basically, modern-day butchers. They would slaughter um, all kinds of like cows and bulls and, and sheep and goats, and then they would... They would cut them, you know, butcher them, uh, and get the meats out and the different things, and they would cook them. They would burn them. It's a burnt offering on this altar, which, believe me, would have smelt very good. It was like a barbecue going throughout this area. It was very good-smelling, beautiful place, this tabernacle. There was barbecue inside. There was this incense, which smelled really good, and it was very beautiful and decorated very beautiful. So this is where the burnt offerings were, and they were offered to the Lord, and the people got to eat some of it, too. They got to have barbecue together, you guys. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? God, God's into barbecue. But seriously, I, I'm joking there. But seriously, this was all about what God commanded, and he was doing it for a reason. So in Leviticus 1, it says, Take a male without blemish to be a substitution. Jesus was a male, right? He was without blemish. He was perfect, the perfect son of God, right? So we see that in Leviticus. So Ephesians clarifies that for us in the New Testament, right? Ephesians 5.27 says that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless or without blemish, right? And how was the church, his bride, without blemish? Because he was out without blemish. He was the perfect sacrifice without blemish. We are in Christ Jesus. When you're, and, and Paul repeats that so many times. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. There's no punishment. In Christ, that's where your peace is found. In him. You abide in him. He's our dwelling place. We live in him. He lives in us. And it's a beautiful thing because you're clothed in his righteousness because he was without blemish. He was the perfect sacrifice. See how that works? Not you. You don't have to go through all that. Jesus did the heavy lifting. So you don't have to. It's amazing that God did this for us, you guys. All right, let's continue on here. So Leviticus 2, we see the grain offering, and this is... This is a whole new thing here. This It's another offering, but a whole other picture of Jesus Christ. It's pretty amazing. So Leviticus 2 says, Now when anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, he shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take from it his handful of its fine flour the finest flour, the finest bread, right? Don't you love fresh baked bread? Isn't it so good and delicious? But it was the finest. It was the best. And it continues, and of its oil, and remember the oil was always symbolic of the Holy Spirit, right? The olive oil. You could read Zechariah and understand that. Even in the Old Testament, God says the oil represents the Holy Spirit, this olive oil that which was poured in, right? 
Uh, the oil is symbolic of that. We know that very clearly. So he says, take the oil too. And that word Messiah or Mashiach, if you're in Israel, right? It means anointed one. And what does that mean, anointed one? Well, it means he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Remember, Samuel poured the oil over David. Moses poured the oil over Aaron. It ran down on his beard and down his garments down the hem of his garments. And that's a picture of God's spirit being poured into him. Just like Jesus, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And he was, and God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit was coming down as a dove, as a picture of a dove. Says, There's another symbol of the Holy Spirit is the dove. And not just the olive oil, but it's both of them. <laughs> All right. So then Leviticus 2 continues. So here's Aaron being blessed by Moses. It's a great picture, actually, because this is probably what it looked like. Here's the tabernacle. Here's one of the high priests. could be Joshua right here. We don't know for sure. But here's some of the priests, the Levitical priests inside of this tabernacle area. And here you see Aaron, the high priest, being blessed by Moses, and the oil was poured down upon him in the Bible. So here you see um, Leviticus 2 with all of its, there's frankincense, it continues, with all of its frankincense. God's into good smells, you guys. If you're into like all the, you know, the good smelling aromas and all these things, God created that. He created your sense of smell, he cre created your sense of vision, the beautiful mountains that you see in the ocean and, and just beautiful things that you see in this world, little children, uh, you know, uh, plants and trees. If you're a mother, your little baby, right? And, and a father, it's your baby's the most beautiful thing. God created that. He loves beauty and he made it through the, the vision, right? Your sense of vision, smell, touch, hearing. Uh, God is into that. You guys taste, right? The barbecue that was going on here in this tabernacle. So with all of its frankincense, here he says, you know, Put the frankincense in there too. Now, where else do we see the frankincense? Yes, at Jesus' birth, right? So what is frankincense? So here's a tree. This is what they look like. And they're actually, they're still harvested today from the, um, it's the sap that comes out. Here's a little cutaway of it. And then here's the dried frankincense right here. And it crystallizes, it gets hard as it gets dry. And this stuff's very valuable. And they use it for incense, right? It's a great fragrance. It smells really good. Here's somebody burning some as incense. So Leviticus 2 continues, And the priest shall offer it up in smoke as its memorial portion on the altar. An offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. Because incense is always a picture of our prayers to God. He, ah, he smells our prayers. He, he lets them go into his, his body, you know, right into his lungs and, he, and, and his sense of smell. God has that too. We're made in his image, you guys. And he smells our prayers and they're sweet to him. A soothing smell. God loves it when you pray, you guys. So Bethlehem means what? House of bread. And we just saw that in that sacrifice, the grain offering, right? And where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. It means house of bread. It's so good. So Leviticus 16 helps us see how Christ's death atoned for our sins and carried them away, allowing us to stand stand righteous before God because we're clothed in his son. Jesus is righteous. It's not our own. Before God with direct access to him. And that's in Romans chapter 5. If you want to reference the New Testament, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it's Christ's death that atone for us. So Leviticus 16 says, He shall then take the two goats. This is a different, this is chapter 16, a whole different sacrifice, but you see Christ in it in this book of Leviticus. This is about the scapegoat. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway at the tent of meeting, right? The tabernacle, right? Right about here. He would take the, the goats, the two goats, which will which are, which are called the scapegoat. One of them is called the scapegoat, and you're going to see why. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat, right? Casting lots. We saw that at the cross, 
And here you're about to see a substitution. So what Jesus, when he was on that cross, what did he see? He saw the Romans casting lots for his clothing, right? In other words, for your righteousness. We're clothed in his righteousness, and we're seeing lots casted for that in the the whole scene of the cross. So Leviticus 16 continues, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell, and make it a sin offering. A sin offering. So this is a great picture and illustration of what Aaron may have looked like here. And he would take a yarn with the, it was dyed with that crimson red, right? Just like the Tola Shani in Psalm 22. The worm of Psalm 22 was was where it's actually like a grub. They would crush, they would dry it and collect these and take them off of trees and they would crush them. And then they would get the red dye from it. And then he would tie this yarn, this big yarn around the goat, right, and um, and around the scapegoat, and it would be a picture of our sins being the scapegoat, which would disappear. You're going to see that right here. So Leviticus 16 continues, Then the goat shall carry on itself all their wrongdoings, all their sins, right, to an isolated territory. He shall release the goat in the wilderness. So as far as the east is from the west, from the east to the west, which goes forever, right? If you think about it, so your sins shall be, God said, right? In his word, as far as the east is from the west, your sins will be cast away, you guys. So it's amazing. So the goat shall carry on itself all the wrong doings to an isolated territory, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Your sins will be far, far away. But we want to go back to this, Abraham, the father, and then the son, Isaac, his only son, whom he loved, God said, and take him to that mountain, what mountain? The mountain of where Jerusalem is, right? That's where Mount Moriah was. And what is he carrying on his back? What's Isaac, a picture of Jesus carrying on his back? The wood. He's carrying the wood on his back, just like Jesus carried the cross. And what is the father carrying in his hand? The torch right? Which speaks of God's wrath, the Father's wrath, because it was to be lit for the burnt offering. So there's a huge, huge picture of Jesus in that, you guys. It's amazing, you guys. So hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, I would recommend that you hit that button right down here. Click on it. Click that like button as well. It gets these videos out there and share it with your friends. Um, We are doing a series, Jesus in the Old Testament. You can click on this playlist right here and see all of it. So click on this playlist right here.